There we go. Acts chapter 5 is where we'll be this morning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to go and visit Rob Kraus and JM and spend time with my wife. And uh, I will miss you, but I'm looking forward to what God does during that time. Way back in the 1900s, I was an eighth grader at Litchfield Elementary School. And I sat by Michelle. Michelle was like, she was like one of those cool girls. Like she was cute and she, you know, her hair was right and she was super friendly. And you know what? She laughed at my jokes. And I, I thought we were friends. But Michelle had a boyfriend. And his name was Tommy Delato. May not be his real name, but Tommy Delato was her boyfriend. Now he went to a different school. But I knew him because of sports. Now Tommy Delato, Tommy Delato was a man child. He was a he was a boy with a razor. He had clearly, he had clearly skipped a grade, maybe even two. Now, one day, Michelle warned me. She warned me that Tommy was upset and that he was going to give me a call. So he did. So he called me at my house, and he says this. I heard you called my girlfriend a B-word. Beep. And I said, it's not possible, man. I would never say that, and I don't even cuss. And his response was, click. Well, a few days later, he calls back. By this time, I had some time to think about it. And he says, I'm coming tomorrow after school, and I'm going to kick your beep. So I said, go for it. (laughs) Next day after school, I was walking home, and I had to walk across the, the, the fields of the school. And that's when I saw him. I saw Tommy, Tommy Delato. And all his friends piling out of a car on the street across the field. Who drives a car to an eighth grade fight? (laughs) Tommy and his friends do. So we met in the middle of that field. Now in my day, you were cool now, this is going to, some of you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about. But in my day, you were cool if you wore designer jeans, you know, like Jordache, and they had the stitches right up the side. You were cool if you had feathered hair and you wore K Swiss sneakers. Well, I was not so cool. I, uh, I wore big old thick Coke bottle glasses. I didn't have a professional haircut. My mom cut that bowl cut right around, just like that. And I, I, I think I attempted to be cool because I didn't have Jordash jeans, but I did have fresh squeeze jeans. I didn't have K-Swiss, but I did have Kmart sneakers. And when I turned around, I kid you not, to hand my trombone to my friends. That's when Tommy struck. When I wasn't looking, Tommy hit me right in the jaw. So I turned around and Tommy's ready. Boy child is ready, so he kicks me and I just stand there. So he goes, kicks me again. And I just stand there. And finally, Tommy and his friends leave. What else was there to do? Well, the next day, my PE teacher, I would call him coach, 
heard about the scuffle. And he looked at me, and I still remember this to this day. He looked at me and he says, why didn't you just clean his clock? Why didn't you just fight him? And my answer was, I don't know. All that long summer, I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. Laying in bed, taking a shower, wherever I went, I was constantly, constantly asking myself, why didn't you fight? Why did you just pack it in? Now, my ultimate solution was this. Play it cool. I had a whole summer to think about it, to take a step back and to think about how I could respond so that I wouldn't have to go through this humiliation again. So my freshman year, I exchanged my Coke bottle glasses for contacts. I went to the hair cutting place and paid money to get a feathered hairdo. I got Levi's button fly jeans and I played football. I changed my whole posture and my solution got me through, but it didn't solve my problems. It was simply a strategy to save face. That's all it was. We're all familiar with conflict in this world, aren't we? You guys ever experience any kind of conflict? It's the, it's the very reason that, that every book and every movie and every TV show is based on conflict and conflict resolution, isn't it? I may or may not be following a very popular Western series on Paramount+. Plus, and it is chock full of conflict. Small conflict, large conflict, how are they going to get out of this conflict? Conflict, conflict, conflict. And I don't have to be explained what's going on because I know conflict, whether big or whether small. And in everyday life, we're all going to face conflict, whether big, whether small whether it just comes on us or whether we choose it, regardless of whether we choose it or not, we have to choose how to respond to it. And that's what our message is about today as we jump into Acts chapter 5. See, in our world, there are three typical ways to resolve conflict. We can pick a fight. We can pack it in. We can play it cool, but we have to choose one. Today, as we examine this passage, we're going to see all of those three things in play, plus one more that will surprise us. Let me pray. Father God, as we open your word now, speak to us. Speak to us in a way, Lord, that would move us to a deeper understanding of who we are in you that we would know your grace and that it would change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Okay, so as we jump into, we're going to start in chapter 5, verse 12. Now, I'm not going to have all the words up on the screen. I will try to, to keep you oriented through some slides, picking out some, some highlights of those passages. So open your Bibles. Go to chapter 5. Let's just start in verse 12. And what, as we start in this narrative, remember, we're, this is Luke telling us the story of the early church. And as I was thinking about how to introduce, to set the scene of the conflict here in chapter 5, it dawned on me that what we're seeing up to, the first, up to these first five chapters of Luke is we are seeing the intense nature of the Christian life. The intense nature of the Christian life. These new believers, this new church isn't in Jerusalem just sitting around getting update notifications on their smartphones. They are engaged in community life. From the birth and the overflowing excitement of the new church to the preaching 
to the resistance to that preaching, to generosity, to the judgment miracle of Ananias and Sapphira and miraculous healing, their life is a picture of intensity. And that's where we pick up in verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico. They're at the temple. They're in Solomon's portico. Thousands of people gathering around them. None of the rest of the people dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. Verse 14, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. We've seen this over and over and over in Luke already in the first year of this church. 15, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. And the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Stop and just try to imagine the spectacle of this intense Christian life. But let's continue reading because here comes the conflict. Verse 17, but. But. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that's the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and they put them in the public prison. But, filled with jealousy. Now why are these cats so angry? Well, I think... I think Here's my favorite, favorite phrase. Their message, the apostles' message, blocked their goals. See, we have to, we have to remember that the parties involved here, these, these, these spiritual elites, these religious elite Jews, that they, they are highly motivated people. And they have deep, strong desire for authority and power. And they are willing to kill for it. Now, James is one of the apostles that's been thrown in prison. Later on, he writes a letter to all the Jews, the Christian Jews that were dispersed. And it's in the first chapter of that letter, verse 14, he kind of explains the heart of these angry men. And he's talking about He's just explaining temptation and where it comes from and how it works. And he says this. First he says, temptation is not from God. Then in verse 14, he says this. This is chapter 1, verse 14 of James. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And what comes from sin? And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Their earth-oriented desires have wooed them into the bedroom of jealousy. And a sin baby is conceived. And when that baby grows up, it brings death. See, this is, this is what these religious elite know. This is the air they breathe. And they see the disciples' message and their presence for what it is. It's an aggressive attack on everything they believe and hold dear in everything that they've built their life around. Scholars call this a polemic. A polemic is an aggressive attack on an opposing belief or principle. I love that word. That's why I'm telling you, I didn't know what it meant like 10 years ago. But then I realized that the whole Bible, all of the Old Testament, 
is a polemic against all of the darkness and sin and false worship around it. When we go through the gospel of John, it's a polemic to all of the false beliefs and unbelief and the darkness around it. These men are angry because they see these apostles and their message for what it is, a polemic, and they are infuriated, filled with jealousy. And what we see here in Luke is that God's church is born into a God-hating, hostile world that is steeped in the message of death. These apostles, although they don't pick a fight, they don't just pack it in either. Here's what they do. They keep obeying God. They keep proclaiming Jesus, not just Jesus in fresh squeezed jeans and feathered hair. They're preaching Jesus as a polemic, all of who he is, as an opposite in every way. And this little church, regardless of the danger that comes from preaching and teaching and living out that kind of polemic, guess what they do? They never quit. They never alter their message. Let's keep reading. Verse 19. But during the night... An angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and he brought them out. And then the angel said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. What's their message? What made them so angry? It's right here, verse 20. All the words of this life, Jesus' life. Jesus' name. We did this last week, right? He is risen. And he gives life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If Christianity, if I'm sorry, if Christianity is anything, It is life. I think this is a beautiful way to refer to the gospel. Give them all the words, literally all the words of this life, this eternal life, this abundant life, this life in Christ. Go ahead to the temple. Speak these words. Again, Why is life so offensive to these men? Here's why. Because in their thinking, in their thinking, Christ's gain of life is their loss. The death message has shaped their thinking. We might call it a zero-sum thinking, right? Your gain is always going to be my loss. My gain is going to be your loss. And so it's the survival of who's going to win. If you don't like that I have authority, you better take that authority from me so you can have authority and I won't have any. And it goes round and round. And it's, it's full of conflict. And that's their kind of thinking. But the disciples, in their message, they're showing a different kind of thinking. They're showing a first fruits mentality, not a zero sum mentality. A first fruits mentality. Christ's gain is their gain. We saw this last week as well. Paul writing to the disciples in Corinth, he says this. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He says, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now that is a good Christian phrase. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Well, what's he referring to? He's referring to something that this religious elite would know well. He's referring to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, their scriptures. 
And he's referring to Deuteronomy, one of those books. And he's saying that, you know, the first fruits, those ones that were the very best fruits of your harvest, it's the very best part of the crop. And when you give those, they represent to Yahweh everything to come. So take it to the sanctuary, put these first fruits on the altar as representation of all the harvest. See, God was the true owner of their land. He was the true owner of their fruit, of everything that they harvested. And so they pay a tribute that acknowledges that this is all his. They can't bring in all the barley and all the corn, all the things, that the wheat. They can't just bring it all in and put it on that altar. Every time it comes in, they give the first fruits that represent all of those fruits, the entire portion. See, those first fruits represented the middle fruit and the harvest of the end fruits. That's what he's saying here. So in calling the resurrected Christ the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, Paul is saying basically this, there's more to come. There's more life to come. There's more believers to come. That's why they keep getting added to the church. There's more to come. So Paul goes on to say, he says this. Now he's referring to to more of the Torah and Genesis and Leviticus. He says, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection, life, right? Resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. The Israelites in the Old Testament may not have realized that, they, that when they brought those first fruits, that they were foreshadowing the first fruits of Christ's resurrection on the cross, but they were. Now, with eyes wide open, we can read that same Torah and we can see the work of Christ foreshadowed. More life is coming. That's why we celebrated Easter last week. His resurrection is our resurrection. His gain is our gain if we believe. And if this is true, and it is, the priests and the Sadducees would not have the influence they desired. Why? Because they didn't believe If Jesus' death was the final blow, then they could stay in power. Do you see that? But if he's alive, they'll lose everything. They know it, and they're angry. So let's see what happens. Verse 21. And when they heard this, this is the apostles, right? And they heard, go back to the temple, preach those words. When they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. What were they teaching? The message of life. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. Go get those fellas, those rule breakers. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the, pres- in the prison, so they returned and they reported. <coughs> Uh, We found the prison securely locked, the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and told them, look, the men you put in prison are standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. What are they teaching? The message of life. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them. And this is what he said, verse 28. We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus, 
the name of life. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. What is he teaching? The words of life. Yeah. And you intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter, verse 20, but Peter, verse 29, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, the message of life, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. What did they do? They got the message of death. They hang him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader, as savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, which is life. And we are witnesses to these things. And so this, so the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those... Di- I'm sorry. Let me read 32 again. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Two things to note here. First, this. Do you see that God is infinitely and intimately involved in everything that is happening here in this conflict? In typical divine irony, he sends an angel to rescue them from the jail. And who put them there? The Sadducees. And the Sadducees don't even believe in angels. (laughs) Guess what else they don't believe in? The resurrection. And here's the message of life. The second thing to note here is this, is that, that, that God doesn't just release them from a very difficult situation so that they can be, have an easy time. What does he do? He sends them right back to the place that got them in trouble in the first place. God has bigger plans for them. The command sounds so incredible if we stop and think about it. But I would say this, and so is their response. What did Peter say? We must obey God rather than men. Obedience is often dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. Obedience is often dangerous, and God is always in it with us. We must Obey God rather than men? Do you see how powerful that one word must is? They weren't to consider this as maybe an alternate route. They weren't there to ask if it was safe. That's not what they asked. They didn't go, is this safe? Can we go back there for reals? All they asked was this. Is this what you want me to do? Is this what you want me to do? Now think about this just for a moment. Think about the implications of this truth in our lives today. Christian parents, let me talk to you. Kids of Christian parents, let me talk to you while I'm talking to them. Pipe up, listen to this. How do you instruct your children to obey? What are you raising your children for? Do you imagine a life for them that's full of comfort, full of ease, where they can be morally compliant, nice Christians who have a good job and live nearby? Or... Do you teach them costly obedience? Are you asking, are you teaching your kids to ask, is it safe? Or are you teaching your kids to ask, is this what you want me to do? Super practically or real quick. If you have, if you have, if you have children, you are to instruct those children in the way of the message of life. And when you allow your kids, like when you tell them to do something and you allow them to say no, and so you give them another alternative, guess what you're teaching them to do? To consider. See, obedience is often dangerous. And 
God is in it with us because he has a better plan. Verse 33, let's keep going. When they heard this, when the religious elite heard this, they were enraged. Now they want to kill him. From jealousy to murderous rage because the teaching of life threatened their power and influence in this world. In this world. Ladies and gentlemen, the sin baby is all grown up. And here it is. But before we get to the very end of our passage, let me read to you verses 34 through 39. What we have is a picture of one of these religious elites, and he's got a little bit different tack. Verse 34, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, he stood up and he gave orders to put these men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you're about to do with these men. For before these days, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody. And a number of men, about 400, they joined him. Then he was killed and all who followed him were dispersed and it came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census And drew away some of the people after him. He too perished. And all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Super pragmatic. Maybe even professional. But it's wrong. Here's why. Because as we take a closer look at what he's doing here, we realize that all of his comparisons are out of whack. Right? He, he compares the followers. You know, all of those hundreds of followers How many followers have we seen after Christ's death and resurrection just within this year? Thousands upon, we're like talking tens of thousands. And not only did they, the number different, but what they did, they dispersed when Theudas was killed, right? These guys are still in Jerusalem. They're still sticking around. There's no dispersion. The second comparison is in the fruit of each movement. Those came to nothing. Theudas, Judas, their movements came to nothing. But why are we even in the court being questioned? Because it came to something. Many signs, many wonders. Verse 12, right here. It came to something and they knew it. And then finally, a comparison of the death of Jesus to those who rose up. They died and stayed dead. But the whole point here is that Jesus died and he rose again. This is what Gamaliel should have said. He should have seen all of this coming. And he should have said, men, when Jesus died, his movement was supposed to die with him, but it didn't. That makes him different than Theudas and Judas of Galilee. So maybe we should start at least considering the possibility that we were wrong about him. Could it be that what these apostles of his are saying about him is true? He didn't say that, but he should have. See, the fact was this, that the Sanhedrin already had the most positive proof that the work of the apostles was of God. They already had it, but they didn't believe, and they didn't want to believe. They already knew it was from God, but they would not believe, no matter how much time they took to examine it. So this is what Gamaliel did. Gamaliel, all he did was, he says, says, I'm I'm going to figure out a way to save face. I'm going to play it cool. So what happened? Well, verse 40, they took his advice. 
And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. Okay. They listened to him, and then they gave him 40 lashes. Then they let him go. Beaten and bloodied and ordered to keep their mouths shut. How should these disciples respond? Should they be like the religious elite who roll up their sleeves and pick a fight? Let's bare knuckle brawl. Should they just pack it in? Should they just leave? Should they just be silent? Give up, roll over, let them scratch their belly. Maybe they should be like Gamaliel and play it cool. You know, figure out a better way to save face. Which one would you choose? Which one should they choose? How about none of the above? See, they did something other than that. They did something surprising. They persevered. Look at verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. <laughs> They've just been beaten, bloodied. And they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day they kept telling the truth, teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus, the ultimate mic drop. They did, like, oh yeah, you want to beat me? I consider it joy. They persevered. The biblical word for perseverance is steadfast. They remain steadfast. Again, James, one of the apostles, later says in, that, in his letter, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This conflict and their response to it, this response of perseverance represented an opportunity for them. An opportunity for them to be steadfast, to gain what is good. An opportunity to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. This is an opportunity for them to consider it joy and persevere so that they would be like Christ in all ways, even in suffering. And being like Christ is the definition of what is good. They knew to the point of rejoicing that they were going to gain what is good. My pastoral concern for Grace Church is that we suffer from the trial of prosperity. We, we, they're, they're suffering in this room and I, I'm not belittling any of that. But in general, the, 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 it's, there's not the intensity in our face, but it's coming. I believe it's coming. But we have been lulled into sleep because of our prosperity. And we actually believe that our desires should be met by God. We have this general sense that costly obedience for the cause of Christ is totally out of the question. Just a general sense, like, oh, don't, I'll do it, but if it hurts, if it's not safe, I'll think about it some more. I think if we're honest with ourselves that we believe that we exist to be pampered, not persecuted. And it shows up when we face these various trials. We don't drop the mic with joy. What do we do? 
We gripe and we complain. We get angry and we insist that God end the difficulty right now. Beaten and bloodied, the apostles' first impulse was to rejoice. How about you? How about us? Would you rejoice? Jim prayed about it this morning. He said, we have a barrage of attacks on our life. This message of death is loud and it's constant. We feel it in our homes. We talk about it with our children. We see it in the news with our coworkers. Conflict is coming. Actually, conflict is, is like I hate this. What's the bug that eats wood? Thank you. Conflict is like termites in Arizona. You either have them or you're going to get them. How will you respond? See, the the gospel, this message of life, causes us to think differently than the world around us. us. The gospel causes us to fix our minds on eternity. Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We often have little concept of costly obedience simply because... We are fixed on our temporal existence rather than on eternal realities. Let me leave you with an example. There's a pastor named Kifa Sampengi. Way, way, way back in the 1900s and the 1970s. And he lived under the cruel dictator Idi Amin. Idi Amin was not a good guy. He slaughtered thousands of Christians in Uganda during the 70s. And this is what Pastor Kifa Sampengi said. He said, It was true that we, believers, had no earthly count or earthly court of appeal. There were no policemen, there were no soldiers or government officials from whom we could seek help. We had nothing left. We had come so low, only God could help us now. In his book, he wrote a book called A Distant Grief. And he wrote this about his relationship to God while living under this unrelenting threat of death. He said, my concern for my own safety became secondary to my desire to witness the power of God. And I knew that as a community of believers, we of the redeemed church were experiencing his grace now more than ever before. We were learning to live in the everlasting now. To let scripture alone form our expectations and to pray without complaining. He said, he went on and he says this, he said, it was no longer the days themselves that we desired, but the forgiveness and the love of God. In the uncertainty of our day-to-day existence, we were being delivered from our reliance on methods, from the idols of self-trust and self-pity. We could no longer afford to ask converts, do you believe? We asked, are you ready to die for Jesus Christ? about you beaten bloodied dishonored they responded with joy how about you if you're not a believer this morning maybe maybe none of this makes sense 
I mean, why would you lean into suffering? Well, let me, let me give you one gospel truth that may help you think about it rightly. When we're suffering as believers, we don't look to the cross of Jesus Christ for the answer to why we're suffering. We know that the answer isn't there. But as we look to the cross, we know that it will tell us what the reason isn't. It'll tell us not. It'll tell us what the, the the reason for our suffering isn't. The reason for our suffering is not that God does not love us. The reason for our soft suffering can't be because He has no plan for us. It can't be that He's abandoned us. See, we know this: that the Father abandoned Jesus, so He would never have to abandon us. Do you see that? He raised Jesus from the dead so that we would share in his life. He has a plan for us, and we know that when he comes back again, we will truly live. We will live with him forever. Let's pray. Father God, teach us. the truth of the message of life in such a way, Lord, that we would know how to respond to conflict. And let us delight in every opportunity we have, Lord, to make much of you with joy. Amen.